Okay, I've got a few questions for us to work through now that you've finished reading all of chapter 17. This first one takes us back to last Friday's lecture when we first discussed aromaticity. It's asking why our structure on the slide here um, is not considered aromatic. And we've got three um, particular reasons. It could be any one or all of these. Um, so if we are looking, um, first off, it's most obvious to me that um, three is a reason why this structure can't be aromatic. It does not have a continuous cyclic system of pi orbitals. We only have one pi bond in the system. Now, if we look at two, it does in fact contain four n plus two pi electrons because it contains two, four, six. And so if n was equal to one, we have our six pi electrons here to meet Huckel's rule. However, it is not going to be planar. This is effectively a cyclohexene ring, which can take on a chair conformer. And of course, chairs are not going to be planar. And so the best answer is going to be C for one and three in the reasoning. All right, now we're looking at three structures. Which of these are aromatic? And so we need to assess each one of them. And if you remember, there are two requirements for aromaticity. One is continuous um, p orbital overlap. And the other is that Huckel's rule for n plus 2 pi electrons, um, which we can also think of as an odd number of pi bonds. So um, when I look at A, I see that we do have all sp2 hybridized atoms in this aniline. And remember, anulenes can be aromatic or anti-aromatic um, or non-aromatic. It just depends on the number of pi bonds and whether the structure is planar. So here we see, um, counting our pi electrons, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. And so if n was to be 3, that will give us 14 pi electrons, and so A meets our requirements for aromaticity. If we look at B, uh, if you recall what you've read, our hetero atoms with lone pairs, um, the lone pairs uh, can participate in aromaticity if that will allow the molecule to be aromatic, and so that sulfur is actually an sp2 hybridized orbital, meaning one of the lone pairs is in an unhybridized p orbital. If that's the case, we count those in our pi count, pi electron count, so that's two, four, six, that's the same number of electrons as pi electrons as we have in benzene, and so B is also going to be an aromatic structure. Now, if we come over here to C, counting our pi electrons, two, four, 6, 8, 10, and if we do 4 times 2 plus 2, that will give us 10 electrons. So it is also meeting Huckel's rule. Um, all of them had continuous p orbitals, and so in fact, a, b, and c are all aromatic structures. Now we're looking at anions. So, of course, the first thing we want to look for is continuous p orbital overlap. C has this sp3 hybridized atom in it, so C has already been taken out of the running. If we look at A, it has um, two pi electrons here, and then if we're assuming that it has p orbital overlap, and that this is an sp2 hybridized orbital, um, we get four for our electron number. Um, nothing that we can do can make this fit four in plus two, um, and so this is not going to be an aromatic structure. B, having a carbon ion, um, and counting those electrons in the uh, aromatic pi electron count gives us two, four, six electrons, same number of benzene, and so B is going to be aromatic. Um, we have to count those electrons because otherwise our carbanion carbon would not be 
um, would not contain an unhybridized p orbital. So that's going to be an sp2 hybridized orbital. We've already covered C, so if we go over to D, and once again, we're assuming this carbanion is an sp2 hybridized orbital in terms of counting our pi electrons. Um, otherwise, it would be non-aromatic. So for counting purposes, we say we've got two, four, six, eight electrons, which of course does not meet Huckel's rule. And so instead of this being anti-aromatic, we would call this structure non-aromatic. And our carbon ion would actually exist as an sp3 hybridized atom. Um, same thing for C, non-aromatic here. And so we see B being the only structure, um, the only anion on that selection that was actually aromatic. Okay, so now we have a fused ring system in B, a carbanion in A, and C is an annuline. So again, we want to verify that our structures have the overlapping p orbitals. A does have that, if we call that an sp2 hybridized atom, and we see two, four, six pi electrons, the same number in benzene, so if n is equal to one, we end up meeting Huckel's rule for our number of pi electrons, and so A is going to be aromatic. If we start counting our electrons in B, we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, and then 24. And of course, 4 times 5 plus 2 gives us 22. 4 times 6 plus 2 gives us... Um, 26, and so nothing that we can do to our n as a whole number will allow b to be um, an aromatic structure, and so b is not going to be aromatic. C, our aniline, has 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 electrons, and so once again, we are met with the fact that for um, n plus 2, um, for n plus 2, we could potentially have um, an aromatic situation because 4 times 4 is 16 plus 2 would give us 18, but this is such a large structure, the chances that it would actually stay planar are very low, and so we're going to have a non-planar structure, and that would take C out of the running for an aromatic compound as well. And so we're left with A as a small enough structure to stay planar, and have that p orbital overlap and still have the correct number of electrons. Okay, that brings us to the very last um, part of chapter 18, which is benzene reactions. A lot of this was review for the benzyl position, and um, there was a couple of new reactions, including the one that we see on this slide here for the benzyl position, um, as well as um, some benzene reduction reactions. So this is asking which one of these reactions will take place as written. This is one of our new, and really it's not a new oxidizing condition, it's just a new caveat for an oxidation reaction. Here we see the um, reagents for making um, one of our chromic acid, our Jones reagent oxidizers. And if you recall from your reading, the, these conditions will oxidize the benzyl position, okay? And it will oxidize it all the way to a carboxylic acid, which means that it will actually cleave off um, any carbons that are attached onto the benzyl position that aren't part of the ring. 
the main thing, remember, for our oxidation reactions is that we have to have at least one hydrogen atom in order to do these oxidations. So A, we're lacking a benzyl position. It's a benzene ring, but there's no benzyl position, that one away position. Okay, C isn't a benzene ring to begin with, so that is not going to proceed the way that we would have expected. And D, our benzyl position is there, but there's no hydrogens available um, to pull off in that oxidation process. So that eliminates D as a possibility. B, we have the benzyl position um, that is getting fully oxidized in the product. And of course, the, the methyl that is actually part of that ethyl um, that's attached to the benzene in the starting material, the CH3 is getting cleaved off through this oxidation process, but B is the correct answer. Um, that's the reaction that will take place as written. Okay, so this is a multi-step synthesis. What's the product of the reactions shown? So step one is NBS. That's going to um, put a bromine on that benzyl position. So that's free radical bromination. And then our sodium ethoxide, you should immediately see this, think of it as a base, and so it's going to do an elimination. And in fact, it's going to take this bromine that we just put on, and it's going to eliminate it and put a double bond there um, between that benzyl position and the CH3. Down here, it's listed as two separate steps because they need to be listed as two separate steps. We learned them together as our anti-Markovnikov um, hydration reaction. So the thing we have to remember is that um, we will be adding our alcohol to the less substituted position. And so if we had an, a product after our elimination that was effectively styrene, then we can easily picture how our final product would be um, putting the hydroxide on that terminal alkene, giving us B as our correct answer. Um, and of course, A would have been our product after step two. C um, actually eliminates a carbon, so we're if we're counting carbons, we're not... Um, allowed to do that given the reactions here. We certainly have reactions where we can lose carbons, but not the conditions that we were provided. And then D is actually the product after step one. Okay, here's another multi-step synthesis. We've got a carbonyl in our starting material. And so maybe one of the first things you think of nowadays when you see a carbonyl is Grignard. Well, if we look at our product, we're not actually gaining any carbons. Um, and so Grignard isn't really going to be playing a part in this. Instead, another reaction that we learned recently that we could do with our um, carbonyls is a reduction reaction. And we see a redu reduction reaction in E. And that's that's going to be the best and safest thing for us to do. It's going to do chemistry at that carbonyl where we're seeing our functional group change because that's one of the things Klein's training us to do. Are we changing our carbon backbone? No, in this case. Are we changing our functional groups? Yes, but we're not changing the location. So if we do a reduction, that will take our carbonyl to an alcohol, right? Okay, so we can picture ourselves having this kind of um, an intermediate product that we've just made. And now we know our alcohols can be converted into good leaving groups through protonation um, and then do a nice um, substitution reaction. Well, D doesn't provide acidic conditions, although it does provide the nucleophile. B... That doesn't work because that is for um, brominating an alkane. We have an alcohol here, and so the next reaction is going to be C. So the correct order would be E and then C.
All right. So here we see um, one of the new reactions for this chapter, and it's reducing our benzene. So it's a Birch reduction. And as you saw in the book and in your slides, this is similar to your dissolving metal reduction reaction um, that we saw in our alkynes chapter. The rule for the, these Birch reductions is that if you have an electron with drawing group, you are going to always um, keep the carbon in the ring that's attached to the electron withdrawing group, like an alkyl group, um, you're going to keep those re um, keep that position hybridized um, in an sp2 hybridization. And so um, C eliminated itself. We don't see um, the cleaving of the ethyl group, okay? Um, B is violating, as is D, um, the way that the reduction is happening. So even if you didn't remember the rule about electron donating and electron withdrawing groups, you could have kind of pieced this one together. Um, our Birch reductions, remember, always have our two pi bonds that are left in the ring across from one another with sp3 hybridized atoms um, in between on the ring. So the correct answer is going to be A. And here we see another one of these Birch reductions. This time we have two functional groups. So we know that our alkyl benzene carbons need to stay sp2 hybridized car uh sp2 hybridized but our nitro groups um and electron um withdrawing groups like that i think i might have misspoke before our um our groups are slightly electron donating our nitro groups are going to be electron withdrawing um, but our alkyl groups are going to want to stay sp2 hybridized the carbon attached to the no2 groups and other um, functional groups like that wants to um, become sp3 hybridized that's the most stable um, way that the mechanism can occur so first we can look at c and realize hey this isn't doing the reduction correctly our two pi bonds aren't positioned um, opposite each other in the ring and so that leaves us with um, a b and d so um, b is taking our carbon in the ring that's attached to the bin um, to the isopropyl group and turning that into one of the sp3 hybridized orbitals that's not going to be a stable um, mechanistic step and that leaves us with A and D. D is the, going to be the correct answer because it keeps our sp2 hybridization for the ring atom that's attached to the alkyl group and it converts the um, carbon in the ring that's attached to the NO2 group to an sp3 hybridized atom. And so we see D being our final correct answer. The last bit of chapter 17 reviews over some um, spectroscopy for these compounds. And so here's kind of an example of how this could be asked in a multiple choice question. Um, there's a slight chance ACS could ask a question like this, but in general, um, they tend to give you more data and actual spectra and things like that. So it says in a proton NMR spectrum or in proton NMR spectroscopy, um, aromatic um, CH bonds show peaks at what ppm? So um, it, 3 to 4 ppm is too far upfield, so that gets rid of C and leaves us with B and D um, where we have our aromatic ranges defined in the first step. IR spectroscopy aromatic CH bonds show peaks at what wave number? And hopefully everybody can recognize this 1450 to 1600 as the carbonyl region, um, not the CH bonds. CH bonds, remember, all of our hydrogen bonds are 
over in the diagnostic region, that 3,000-ish number, and so B was the correct answer.